All right. You know, there are so many things going on, folks, that most of America isn't even aware of. And I got to tell you, it's, it's just killing me that our media is hiding the truth from us in so many different areas. There are a few people that are out there speaking openly about it. But one thing you'll notice is that the mainstream media doesn't want you to hear that kind of talk. They don't want you to hear the kind of talk that the Cato Institute came out with and made the other day, where Michael Cannon from the Cato Institute was asked directly by Congress, what, what could we do, what can America do about a president who continues to operate lawlessly like a dictator? And here's what he had to say. There is one last thing to which the people can resort if the government does not respect the restraints that the Constitution places on the government. Abraham Lincoln talked about our right to alter our government or our revolutionary right to overthrow it. That is certainly something that no one wants to compliment, uh, contemplate. If the people come to believe that the government is no longer constrained by the laws, then they will conclude that neither are they. That is a very dangerous sort of thing for the president to do, to wantonly ignore the laws to try to impose obligations upon the people that the legislature did not approve. And he's right. But I'm going to take it further back. I'm going to say it was even before Abraham Lincoln, because our actual Declaration of Independence is even more candid about it. Our Declaration of Independence says, hey, listen, if you're going to sit there and, and act as a usurper, we have a right as a nation to literally overthrow you and remove you from power. In fact, it's more than a right. Our Declaration of Independence calls it a duty. Now, yesterday, Rand Paul, he made a speech, and he, and he invoked the opening pages of Ray Bradbury's famous novel called, called Fahrenheit 451. And <clears throat> he brings it together with the idea that what we are now what we are now doing and what we have allowed to happen with the NSA monitoring us with all of these laws and rules and regulations that are imposed on us by a bunch of people that aren't even accountable to us. We can't even get them out of power if we want. They're not elected. They're appointed or they're hired. And these people who are writing the Obamacare regulations and are writing these EPA regulations that are about to be shoved down your throat January 1st, you don't even know who they are. They're nameless. They're faceless. We have no control over them. I want you to hear this segment. It lasts about five minutes, but I got to tell you, it is probably one of, the, one of the things that you will hear today that will rock your world. This should be a very, very important wake-up call to the vast majority of people in America who aren't quite recognizing yet how far down the rabbit hole we've fallen. But here's a guy who's an actual senator, and he's telling us in no uncertain terms that we have a problem on our hands that we need to resolve and that we can't continue to ignore it, that we actually have to do something about it. And we do. I mean, we've gotten to the point now where we have lost control of our government. And it's no longer a government by, of, and for the people. It's a government that Congress is using to beat the tar out of us, that our government is using to now become our masters. And he talks about how we cannot allow the flame of liberty to go out on our watch. I got to tell you, we have passed and allowed our freedom to be taken away based on a promise of keeping us safe. The truth is, ladies and gentlemen, Ben Franklin told us very clearly that that was a suicide pact for us to accomplish that. To allow that to go on was a suicide pact. That's what he said. People, the, the, people who will give up their, their freedom for security will get and deserve neither. I want you to hear Rand Paul for a minute. Just ride with me for this four minutes and 58 seconds. It's five minutes. But I'm telling you right now, it's a powerful statement. I want you to hear it. In the opening pages of Fahrenheit 451, Guy Montag asks, 
Wasn't there a time when firemen used to put out fires? They laugh at him and they rebuke him and say, everybody knows firemen start fires. Now Montag knew this. Montag's father and his grandfather had been firemen. It had been his duty for many years to start fires. He knew it was his duty to burn books. But this day was a little bit different. He showed up and the woman wouldn't leave. He said, the woman's on the porch. She won't leave. She has all of her books and she won't leave. So as they're dousing her books and her with kerosene, she shouts out and she goads them. She, she is indignant that they would touch her books at all. And she won't leave. And she says, play the man, Master Ridley. Today we will light such a candle by God's grace in England that it won't be forgotten. They keep dousing her with kerosene, and she says it again. Play the man, Master Ridley. Today we will light such a candle. And the reference is lost on the firemen in the book, and they continue to do their job. The reference is to Hugh Latimer, who became a human candle. He was burned at the stake in 1555 for heresy. His heresy was to oppose the state religion, his heresy was to oppose the state. His heresy was to promote that the Bible be translated into English. Now, we're not yet burning folks at the stake, fortunately. We're not burning books. But your government is interested in what books you read. They're interested in what you say on your phone calls. They're interested in what you write in your emails. This has been going on for a while now. Last week I asked for a report on this and I was given a classified briefing. I wanted to know to what extent is your privacy being invaded? To what extent are they reading your emails, reading and listening to your phone conversations without a judge's warrant? And I can't tell you the answer because it's classified. It's classified how many times they're doing it. But I think what I can get away with saying is that when the government says it's a few hundred, it's closer to a gazillion. All right? And a gazillion's a fictitious number, but it's a very large number, and that is close to the number of communications that are being looked at by the federal government. We are giving up our privacy. We are trading our liberty for some sort of sense or some sort of ostensible security. We've traded our personal privacy and our personal dignity when we travel. I mentioned the other night a couple of stories about the TSA. I'll mention two quickly. There was a man transporting the ashes of his parents, of his father, in an urn. The TSA made him open it. They swirled their fingers in the human ashes. It fell to the floor, and the ashes fell out, and they laughed. Another young man who's deaf was with a deaf group. He comes through with candy in his luggage, and they say, you can't take the candy. You have to donate it, or you don't travel. He donates the candy, and as he walks off, they're laughing at him and saying, you effing deafy, and eating his candy. This is what we've come to. There's a Harvard Law School professor by the name of Noah Feldman, and he wrote recently, he said, the next time the TSA asks you to put your hands above your head a little bit higher, no hun, just a little bit higher, and hold this pose for seven vulnerable seconds, the next time they ask you this, ask yourself, is this the pose of a free man? It's slipping away from us. Hugh Latimer was a human candle, and when he said that let not this episode be forgotten, let this be an episode that will not soon be forgotten, when he became a human candle, he was a human candle against tyranny and intolerance. We still have a torch that's burning. The Liberty Torch is burning, figuratively or otherwise, in New York Harbor. But I exhort you all not to let the flame of liberty go out. Thank you very much. Wow.
the next time airport security tells you to put your hands over your head and hold that vulnerable position for seven long, vulnerable seconds, ask yourself, is this the posture of a free man? Ladies and gentlemen, I think you know the answer to that question. Now, you got a guy here who actually sits on all of these secret committees. He's entitled to know. He's supposed to be a watchdog for us against an NSA operating outside of their constitutional limits. And he says that not only did they tell him, but he's now barred from telling you. Really? Would you accept that from the police department who said, there's been a murder in our town, and we've investigated it, but we're not going to tell you who was guilty, and we're not going to tell you what we're going to do about it. We can't. It's secret. Would you accept that? You see, the problem here is they are operating so far outside the scope of what, if, if we knew how far this really went, and he t he's telling you right here, if we knew as Americans how far this went, there would be an open civil war in this country. And he says, and I'm going to read it to you again. In the summer of 2012, I asked for, and this is, a, this is now, what, a year and a half ago. So think of how much worse it's gotten. In the summer of 2012, I asked for a report on this subject and was given a classified briefing. <clears throat> I wanted to know to what extent your privacy was being invaded. To what extent the government was reading your emails, listening to your phone conversations without a judge's warrant? At that time, I couldn't tell you because the answer was classified. What I could say, though, is that if the government says it's a few hundred incidents, it's actually closer to a gazillion incidents. A gazillion is a fictitious number but it's a very large number and one that is closer to the actual number of the communications that are being looked at by the federal government on a daily hour and even minute to minute basis. Ladies and gentlemen, don't you hear the words that he's telling you? I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you this, you know, when, when Barack Obama was running for office, he said the famous words that we are three days away from fundamentally changing America. And most people didn't quite recognize the importance of those words, because I don't think they really understood what he meant by fundamental change. Now you've got a guy sitting here who sits on all of these secret panels that's entitled to know all this information, and he's got a gag order on him, and yet he's supposed to represent you. Are we not allowed to make our own determinations and our own decisions? You see, this is a suicide pact. And here's the problem. Only one party is making the decision for all of us. You've been involved in a suicide pact that you don't even have a right to know what you've agreed to. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the ultimate betrayal, the ultimate treason, the ultimate unconstitutional action. Would you allow a person to say, listen, there's five of us in this group, and I want you guys to all agree to something we're going to do. I'm not going to tell you what it is. 
but you got to agree to it. And you think, you know, okay, what's he talking about? Maybe he's going to make me drink a beer or, you know, it'll be something silly or we'll have to walk down the road with a sign that says I'm an idiot or something stupid, right? And so you all agree. And then he opens up the trunk of his car and he hands everybody a pistol and he says, now everybody's got to put this to their head and pull the trigger. You see, he was the only one who knew what that pact was really about. You didn't agree to that. And if you had known what it was going to be, you wouldn't have said no. You would have said, heck no. It's even worse. It's even worse. That scenario is bad enough. But I want you to take this one in stride. So now it's the same group of five people. And one of the people is pretty much the acknowledged leader of that group. He's the guy who generally, you know, you've had a circle of friends where one guy kind of arises or one girl kind of arises as the leader of that group. And he gets you all in the car and he says, we're doing something tonight. Get in. And everybody piles in because, hey, you know, <clears throat> he or she has, you know, always been the leader and must have something exciting for us. What are we going to do? Where are we heading? What are we doing? Okay, we're getting in, but what are, where are we going? It's a secret. Just trust me. And as you're racing down the highway, you see him starting to exceed the speed limit. And suddenly the car is going 80 and 90. And you all start looking at each other thinking, what the heck is he doing? What are you doing? Trust me. And then he turns straight into a bridge abutment. Really? Is that what you agreed to? That is what they're making you agree to. You see, they're the leader, and they're telling you, trust us. If you want to take that even a little bit more to heart, imagine a father who gets his family in the car. What father would betray his family like that? That's the logical question, right? No one would think, Dad's going to kill us all. He's our dad. We trust him implicitly. And when the car reaches 100, he turns into the bridge. You see, they're committing us to a suicide pact that we have no say in. And that's beyond treason. It's beyond unconstitutional. It's beyond unfair. It is flat out evil. This is a suicide pact that America has been signed up for. And we're not even allowed to know where we're headed. We don't know the terms. We don't know the conditions. And we've trusted the person in the driver's seat. If you knew that by getting into that car that night, you were going to hit a bridge at 100 miles an hour, would you get in? If you knew that you would agree to take a pistol and point it at your own head, would you have agreed in advance? Of course not. 
is that person who's committed you in that way, are they entitled to your trust and your loyalty anymore? If you escape, if you somehow manage to reach across the separation line of the the hump in the car and jam the brakes on and save your friends, would you ever trust that driver again? That's the position we are in. That is where we are. And the truth of the matter is, the consequences are just as damaging, just as deadly, just as permanent. We have been entered into a suicide pact that we cannot escape from. Not without taking immediate, exigent, emergency action. We now see the driver is turning the wheel, and we know there's a bridge abutment there. There's nothing else in sight. And it dawns on us what the plan really is. How do we react? Well, some will react in fear. Oh, my goodness. Oh, no. Some will react and say, Lord, here I come. Me? I'm pushing him out of the way and I'm reaching for the brake. And if I'm fortunate enough to bring that car to a halt and save myself and the four other people in the back seat, you can bet your bottom dollar I'm taking that driver out of that vehicle and he is not getting behind the wheel again. I didn't sign up for a suicide pact kept from me until the last 11th hour, 59th minute, and 59th second of my life. And I'm telling you, you have an obligation to reach for the break with me. If I'm not successful, maybe you will be. But everybody better reach for the break. The picture's clear. You can look through the drivers. You can look through the windshield. You can see the bridge abutment. There is nothing else in sight. And that car is veering straight at it. And that driver, he's belted himself in, boy, but nobody else is wearing a seatbelt. He's prepared to survive the crash. He's the only one with an airbag, the only one with a seatbelt. That's your Congress. That's your president. That's your administrative agencies. That's your government. And he's planning to survive it. You, not so much. Is that what you signed up for, America? Is that what you agreed to in advance? Is that what you agreed to at all? Do yourself and me a favor. Apply the brakes by sharing this video sharing this audio clip. I don't care if you sit down with five people around the table and say, hey, we're the five in the car, and I want you to just hear this message. Spend a half hour, 20 minutes with me, and at the end of this, we'll have a discussion about it. 
take action. Don't throw your hands up and say, oh, my goodness. Send me an email to mike at americasvoicenow.org if you have some input on this. You can find us at americasvoicenow.org, facebook.com forward slash americasvoicenow. And all of our programs are up on our website at americasvoicenow.org or on youtube.com forward slash americasvoicenow. See you tomorrow morning. God bless.